Oh, why don't you just 3D print it? That is probably the comment we get the most on our YouTube videos. As plastic recyclers that focus on injection molding, we're always being told that 3D printing is a better way to make our products. So we thought we'd try and settle things once and for all. Let's start with 3D printing. It's got a fairly low barrier to entry. Pretty much anyone can buy one, watch a few YouTube videos and get going. They're also great for prototyping new ideas or making small batches of products. Plus they're automated so the machines can work while you're asleep. And the cost of 3D printers themselves have come down massively over the last few years, making manufacturing super accessible for startups and small businesses. And it's easy to print intricate designs that might be difficult or even impossible to make in other ways. But of course, 3D printing does have its drawbacks. Quality is a big issue because if you're looking to make high-end products to sell, you're not exactly going to want layer lines all over them. You can reduce this by switching to resin printers, but these come with their own issues. From an environmental perspective, 3D printing isn't great. There are recycled filaments available, but they're very expensive. And there are also issues with durability and shrinkage you need to consider. It's also really tricky to make your own filament out of plastic waste that's consistent and reliable enough to print with. So let's compare this to injection molding, as when it comes to sustainability, it's a pretty different story. Now we will caveat that we're not talking about huge mass production, commercial injection molding, but a smaller scale setup designed to work with recycled materials. Where using recycled filament can cause a whole host of issues, for this application, recycled materials work perfectly and things like shrinkage are completely manageable. And as waste plastic is literally everywhere, it's easy for us to source and process our own material, plus any waste or scrap can be used over and over again. The other main benefit is quality. Injection molded products are usually stronger because they're made from a single shot of plastic rather than lots of layers placed on top of each other with a hollow center. This also makes the finish much nicer and it's easy to get some really cool looking marbling when you combine different colors. The cost is gonna be one of the main drawbacks of injection molding. We have done a full breakdown comparing a product being made in both methods. And to be fair, the outcome was actually pretty surprising, but we'll take you through that whole thing a bit later on. For this video, we want to use a machine that's as comparable to a 3D printer as possible. So, we're using one of these injection minis from Sustainable Design Studio, as they're £875 for a kit version, and they're powered by compressed air rather than by hand. Right, so now we're up to scratch with how this style of injection molder works. Let's run a bit of a test to compare the speed in making something between one of these and a 3D printer. We're gonna use beads as our product for this test because they're one of the most popular things that we sell. So it would be just generally really helpful to know if 3D printing is a viable alternative option. So in the time that it took to print 12 beads with a 15% infill, we actually injected 300 beads. Obviously beads aren't really something that people would commonly 3D print, so we ran the numbers again using our comb design, as our comb video happens to be the one with about 80% of these 3D printing comments on. So if we wanted to get as close as possible to the quality of our combs with the 3D print, then we'd need to go with 100% infill with 1.5mm layer lines, and the print time for that would be 3 hours and 15 minutes, and in that time we could inject 42 combs. In most cases you're not going to be printing with 100% infill, but even if we drop that down to say 30%, it would still take 2 hours and 9 minutes to print one of those, and in that time we can inject and mould 28. So it's safe to say that injection molding is the clear winner for speed here, but you could argue that 3D print farms are the way to get around their slower production speed. But at the same point, you could kind of say that why don't you just make an injection molding farm? So let's try just that. We've now got a bunch of these injection minis and now we're gonna use them constantly for two full days and see how many beads we can make. So for the first of our two dedicated injection days, we had three of us operating two machines each. But as we got into a good rhythm, we actually dropped this down to have two of us working on three machines each. This felt like a good balance, and it was probably about the maximum number of machines each person could comfortably operate. And as you can probably tell from the way that our hips were shaken, we were really getting into it at this point. 
There is some cleanup required for these beads, but to be fair, it's not actually too hard. And if anything, it's probably less fiddly than cleaning up the 3D printed ones. Now we've got just over 9,000 of these little beads made, we need to work out what to do with them. So we could go with a practical, sensible business application for these and make something like a load of jewellery, but you've seen us do that before, so that's no fun. But one issue that we face on a daily basis is this constant barrage of flies in our office. And no matter how many rubbishy little gadgets we buy, we cannot seem to keep them at bay. Go away. Out. But when we were kids, we remember having one of those beaded fly curtains in the door at our grand's house. And not only did it do an amazing job of keeping the flies at bay, it also made that lovely jangly sound as you walked through it. So let's try and make what will probably be the world's most expensive fly curtain. Ah, <laughs> it's stuck. Nice. Just before we show you the finished fly curtain in all of its glory, you may have noticed that we haven't had anyone sponsor this video, and that's because we are kind of sponsoring it ourselves. We make a range of 100% recycled plastic sunglasses that we call loops. They don't have a microphone on them normally, but they are by far the thing that we are most proud of that comes out of our workshop. They come with polarized lenses. We've got a thing called a loop back scheme. So if they ever break or have any other issues, send them back to us, we'll recycle them again, and then we'll send you out a new pair for free. They have a nice little fold flat court case that we engrave over there. There's a lot of things. We won't give you all the details now, but if you're interested, we'll pop the details down below. If not, you can look at the state of view. This is the minute advertised sunglasses, and he's looking like that. <laughs> if not, then ignore this happened, and let's go look at that curtain. Oh, it's like stars in your eyes. <laughs> Such a, a niche reference. If anyone knows stars in your eyes, let us know. Matthew Kelly? I said Matthew knowing it was Matthew and not knowing it was Kelly. There's going to be so much stars in your eyes content cut out of this video. <laughs> Somebody please agree with me that it was Matthew Kelly. I'm sure it is. It was. It was. I actually do remember it. Doesn't matter. <laughs> So, it has been a week since we finished the fly curtain, and I would want to say it's because we want to do a thorough test before we feed back how effective it is. We're very efficient. It's not because of that, it's because Matt went on a holiday. How was your holiday? It was good. I was in a tent for a week, and I got wet a little bit, but generally enjoyable. That's camping. It's camping. Lovely. Usually, on a normal day here without a fly curtain, we see, I'd say, between five and seven flies. 
about right. Five and seven. Yeah, yeah, I agree. But with the fly curtain being up, in the last week I've seen one fly, mm. and that happens to be when Matt was back in the office. <laughs> You're welcome. He's been camping, it's fine. Don't shower when you're camping. The whole reason we did it was for that jangly sound. Should we do the jangle test? Let's do the jangle test. Hold on. Jangle. Ah, it's really jangle. It does remind me of Graham's old fly curtain, it really does. It's got that real, that real nice sound to it. So pleasant. Before I went on holiday, we did promise that we were going to break down all of the costs and talk about actually comparing 3D printers to injection molders. And since I've been on holiday, I should probably do that. So Shotgun, not me. I'll do it. Okay, so I've been running the numbers and I've got them all on the screen next to me. So I'm going to be looking over here occasionally just to make sure I don't get any of them wrong. But to start off with, what we're going to do is compare the cheapest 3D printing setup to the cheapest injection molding setup. Now the cheapest 3D printer that we can find that's got a good quality rating is the Bamboo Lab A1, which apparently is £269. And then you've got to add the filament onto that and that seems to be around £20 a roll or £20 a kilogram. So if you wanted to have a setup ready to go to start printing with five kilograms of filament, you would have to spend £369. So let's look at the injection moulding machine. So the kit version of the injection mini is £875, but you can't start making products with just the machine. You do need a mould as well. The bead mould we used to make the fly curtain was £395, and you also need to have an air compressor to power the pneumatic piston. Now you can use the same air compressor on multiple machines. We actually used one compressor to power all six machines. So if you're scaling this up, it can be an investment, but for one machine, you are gonna to need to buy that. Now also, we have the ability to shred and process all our own material, so we can take free plastic waste and turn it into usable stock, but to save the cost of having to add a shredder into this as well, I've just added a cost of £5 a kilo, which is a fairly reasonable cost for buying in recycled plastic waste. So for a total setup with five kilograms of plastic ready to go would be £1,480, which means that the 3D printing setup is four times cheaper than the injection molding setup, based on the cheapest options that we can find. But let's bring this back to a speed comparison for a minute because part of the premise of this video is 3D printing versus injection molding. So for the fly curtain that we made, we had six injection minis running, we had two molds, and we had two of us working for two days to make 9,000 beads in total. Now we also needed a third day to snip all the beads off the sprues ready so that they can be assembled. Now to match what we achieved in two days with the injection minis, you would need at least 35 printers. And based on talking to a load of friends and some companies that work on 3D printing on a larger scale, you can't just buy a cheap machine over and over again and make it work. For this, you need a more reliable and a better machine. So based on this, we're gonna be using the Prusa Mark IV for our 3D print farm scenario. And if you wanted 35 of those, it would cost you a sweet 27,900 pounds. So based on this, a batch production setup with 3D printing is gonna cost you 4.1 times more than if you were doing the same thing with injection molding, which is really interesting because it was four times cheaper when you were just looking at one machine versus the other. Now I can almost guarantee there are some of you halfway through a comment talking about how 3D printers can work 24 seven, you don't need to pay any wages, all these types of things. But if you think about it, if you've got a print farm consisting of 35 printers, that is a ton of work to manage all of those. Not to mention having to take all the rafts and support material off, clean up all the material. Plus you're making a ton of plastic waste which is really hard to reuse. Just for fun, I went back and took the 6,700 pounds spent on the injection molding setup and figured out how many printers we could buy for the same amount of money. And it turns out you can buy seven Prusa Mark IV kit setups for that, but it would take you 10 days to print the 9,000 beads compared to the two days we did it with the injection molders. Now this setup is all based around beads, but as you saw, we did run the speed comparison numbers earlier on for combs, and it was kind of a similar story. So no matter which way you look at it, injection molding is just gonna be a faster and cheaper way if you're working at that scale. So after all that, which one is actually better? The injection molding. <laughs> I'm joking. The, they both have their place. I think it depends on what you're making, and I think it depends on how many you're making. Absolutely. But in answer to those comments that we had at the beginning of the video, I think we can conclude after all of this that injection molding definitely works for what we're doing, which is small scale batch production focused on sustainable materials. Yes. I actually think they work really nicely together in the sense that if you've got somebody who wants something designed, but doesn't want to commit to a mold before seeing it in real life, then quickly 3D print one, see if it 
it's what you like, make the changes then, and then go ahead and make the mold. And you know for sure it's going to be exactly what you want. Before, yeah, exactly. Before you commit it to an actual metal mold and use all that energy and spend all the money. Absolutely. In short, if you're just looking to skip to this part of the video and avoid 10 minutes of waffle, what we're trying to say <laughs> is that if you're looking at batch production, say two, 300 items or more, the same thing, go injection molding. If you're looking at individual one-offs or having lots of designs, 3D printing is your way forward. Easy as that.